Hello, everyone. How are we doing? <laughs> it's getting late. It's getting late. But there's an after party later on, so um, you know, hopefully, energised later on in the evening. Uh, Emmett, how, how are you doing? Doing great. Having a having a very nice time coming here. Awesome. Yeah. No, I'm lo loving the energy at, at, at Slush. It's definitely you know such a kind of you know huge uh, conference, um, and there's you know loads going on. And uh, in the sort of you know theme that that's been uh, happening at Slush, it's obviously all about kind of you know uh, a sort of a new dawn and, and you know innovative entrepreneurs going out and starting new things at a pretty rough time for tech and, and for startups generally. Um, and so just in that vein, Emmett, I want to sort of kick things off by getting into your entrepreneurial background. You know, obviously you're the CEO of Twitch today, you know, a company once, you know, that was acquired for nearly a billion dollars by Amazon. Um, but when you started this platform with your co-founders, back then, uh, you know, the real origins, it was just in TV, right? And it was looked very different, I guess, to what it is today. I mean, just run me through, you know, the experience that, that you went through there. Yeah. So. Justin and I are childhood friends, and we started our first company together uh, right out of college. Uh, it was a sort of a knockoff Google Calendar, except that Google Calendar didn't exist yet. So uh, I guess Google Calendar was a knockoff of ours, technically. Um, and uh, we, uh, we sold that on eBay uh, because uh, we had sort of run out of faith in the, in the project, which worked out pretty well, actually. Um, made a very small amount of money, um, you know, a couple of tens of thousands of dollars each. And, uh, and then we were trying to figure out what to do next. And we were having a conversation. Um, I'm pretty sure it was about, like, what should Yahoo, what should Yahoo's strategy be? Like, how do they stop, uh, you know, the, the bleeding? Which I think was a perennial question in tech for about 10 years. And, uh, and we were like, our conversation is really interesting. We're really interesting, which is a, I mean, uh, it was a little bit arrogant, I guess, but we, we felt that what we were ta well, the conversation was interesting, and we thought we should uh, uh, we should record this and share it. Um, but rather than like normal people just like starting a podcast, uh, we took it further and we said, well, we should just record all of our conversations 24/7, and then like uh, use that as the basis. And then we thought, oh, we should just actually just stream it all live. And what if we added video? Oh, we could put like someone's life 24/7 onto the internet. Um, and that was the genesis of you, like, oh, what if we put Justin's life on the internet? It was, gonna, it was clearly going to be Justin and not me, because I'm, Justin wanted to be on camera in that way, and I, I had no interest in that. But uh, uh, we went and started Justin TV, which was originally supposed to be a reality show about Justin's life. Um, we were not good at reality television show production. We were not, it turns out entertainment's hard. Uh, TV is hard to produce, good inter internet reality TV shows are hard to produce, but the tech we had made for that turned out to be good for other people, um, and we uh, pivoted the company to let other people produce their own shows, and that was much more successful. Other people were much better at producing the video than we were, um, and we grew it for a long time. Um, we, uh, we made it through the 2008 crash. Um, we sprinted to profitability. Um, with the instant we saw it sort of go bad, our priority shifted towards profitability. Um, I think that's actually really good advice for anyone who, right now in startups, if you have a running startup and you're not profitable, you might want to spend a good amount of your effort trying to either get profitable or at least don't lose too much money. Um, and then, uh, but we sort of had stopped growing, we were trying to figure out what to do next, and uh, the StarCraft II beta had come out, and I was playing a lot of StarCraft II. And, uh, that game is, was amazing, still is. Uh, and I wanted to get better, and I started watching people play StarCraft on Justin TV. And it was the first time that I had really enjoyed my own product. It was the first time I really liked Justin TV. I was like, this is, this is fun. I, like, you know, I really enjoy watching this. Um, and so I proposed that we pivot the company to focus on gaming. Um, and my co-founders did you know, kind of thought it was an OK idea, didn't really agree. Um, and we kind of, uh, uh, but we did, we pivoted a big part of the company to do that. We also spun off Social Cam, which was a mobile streaming uh, service that we built at the same time. And, uh, uh, and then I started working on Twitch. And the big difference with Twitch was the focus on gaming. Um, and then I think more importantly, I came to understand our most important creators were streamers, not viewers. 
um, we started focusing on the streamers, and I think that was really the the big major change, the big change that made Twitch more successful than Justin TV. And yeah, the, the focus on gaming, and by the way, I completely sympathize with you know looking at YouTube videos to work out where you want in a game. Uh, I've played Resident Evil, several of the games, and constantly getting stuck on all the puzzles, so really yeah. understand where you're coming <laughs> from there. Um, but that was a, a huge focus for Twitch, still is uh, to this day. How did you kind of figure out what would be your bread and butter at Twitch, and what would be your advice to other founders trying to figure that out? Yeah. Um, so I spent a lot of time thinking about the space and strategic, uh, where the strategic value was. What was, the, what was the most important thing to get right? And what I realized was there were about 200 at the time people streaming video games who mattered, who had a, some kind of following or audience. And my realization was, wow, I could talk to all 200 of these people. Like there's nothing st stopping me from going one by one and figuring out what they need and winning them over. Um, and so that's what we did. I went and I, I talked to, I, probably, I don't know if I talked to all 200, but I at least talked to 100 of them. And I came away with sort of a, after sorting through everything I heard from them, uh, I came away with this sort of a, this, well, first core belief that we had to make the video quality really good. If, if the video didn't work, if the live video streaming didn't work well, that was it. But once we had the actual product working, the three things they wanted were, um, they wanted fame, they wanted to grow an audience, um, they, wanted, they wanted what we called love. They wanted to feel uh, positive feedback from Twitch, from the, from the chat room, that things were going well, um, and that they, that they were appreciated. And they wanted to make money. Um, not necessarily lots of money, they, just, they liked the idea. They really wanted to make some amount of money streaming. That was really important to them. And so we focused on those three things. And we focused on delivering those three things over and over again. Um, there's a YouTube video I produced, uh, How to Conduct a User Interview. Um, if you just Google Emmett, Emmett Shear User Interview, uh, that sort of goes through the technique I used in terms of interviewing people to figure that out. Um, because I do think that's one of the most important steps in an entrepreneur's journey when you're trying to build something is to figure out what your customers actually want. Um, but. Uh, but yeah, I talked, to the, I talked to the streamers, and then we started building stuff they wanted. And then we'd go back to them and say, hey, that thing you said you wanted, we built it. It turns out that's a really powerful sales technique. Um, they really liked that. And how kind of hands-on do you get as a, as a founder? I mean, even to this day, do you still find yourself kind of you know, trying to make sure you're addressing what your, your users want? I mean, in the early days, I talked to all the customers directly myself. I even helped build. I was a, engineer, programmer um, for about five years before in, the, in Justin TV, where I wrote a lot of code. And so I still was still writing some amount of code when we started Twitch. Um, so I was very hands-on in design and product and engineering, um, uh, in talking to customers. Um, I did delegate a lot of the business development um, work to, uh, uh, to my co-founder, Kevin, um, who is just an incredible BD person. And, um, and generally just an incredible leader. Um, and he was really instrumental in us doing a lot of the deals, but, um, but I was super hands-on in pretty much everything else. And I really stand behind that. I think that's very important. Obviously, as the company's gotten bigger, I'm no longer nearly as hands-on today as I was, uh, but I still try to talk to customers every week. Um, I think one of the biggest dangers as your company grows is losing touch with what's actually going on. And you have to kind of triangulate that by talking to customers, by looking at the data, um, by reading reports, by getting summaries of what's happening, um, by checking out with social media. You want to have a lot of data sources, not just one. And I want to address you know, the, the way that Twitch does address uh, its users versus some of its competitors. You know, one of the things that Twitch did this year was shift the, the sort of revenue stream um, you know, away from sort of like reducing some of the income that some of its streamers earns. At the same time, you had YouTube trying to kind of you know, up the ante and bring more sort of creators in with YouTube shorts and uh, giving away more revenue share to some of its creators. I mean, how do you sort of stay abreast of the, the competition and, and stay on your feet? So the, in terms of revenue, we, we look at it in terms of how do we make sure streamers make more money every year than they were the last year. That's our goal. Um, and I think we, we did a bad job on the communications um, for that change, because actually very few streamers were actually impacted by the, uh, the change we announced. 
um, almost all streamers, the deal is completely unchanged. Um, I do think uh, it's incumbent on us to provide people a pathway and a vision towards uh, making more money. Um, and I think that uh, there's two competing values. One is literally how do you put more money into streamers' pockets, which I think is one of the critical goals we have every, every day at Twitch. But the other question that we spend a lot of time thinking about is how do we make it feel fair? Because people both care that they, how much money they make, but also that they're paid fairly and that it feels, it feels right. Um, and I think we have a lot of work to do on that front. And convincing creators to stay on your platform must be a, a hard task, you know, having to provide all the perks that make sure that founders, uh, creators are kind of willing to stay on board with you. And I mean, we were just talking backstage about some of the kind of burnout issues that creators do go through. How do you make sure that you're addressing those? Because, you know, again, the, the competition is tough. You know, you've had mm -hmm. some big Twitch streamers this year, like Ludwig, uh, a few others, Valkyrie, who have moved over to YouTube uh, in, in those kind of deals. How do you kind of stop that kind of leakage from happening? Yeah. Um, I think fundamentally, Twitch uh, focuses on how do we deliver more money, fame, and love? How do we make the product better? How do we make streaming on Twitch better? Um, how do we give good support? How do we make sure that it takes less effort to use? And then at the end of the day, we hope that people choose us. We, we hope that we earn their, their business, but uh, not everyone will. And that's okay. Like, I don't, I don't think our job is to be some perfect monopoly that always has 100% of every, every streamer. Our job is to build the very best place to stream. And uh, I think, you know, the, the numbers suggest that people continue to choose us, despite the fact they obviously could choose some other service. Um, and I'm really proud of that. I think that's, that's, uh, that's what's great about capitalism. Uh, you, you, you have real competition. And whoever builds the best product should win. Um, and I think that that's, I really support uh, creating an environment where there is pressure to build the very best thing, to serve your customers the best way. Um, and then, uh, you know, to the, uh, to the victor go the spoils, hopefully. And the creator economy, you know, I guess started in Silicon Valley, but is international. And I mean, obviously, we're here in, in Helsinki, in Finland. Sure, there might be some maybe creators out in, in the audience, you know, listening to, to you to you speak today, um, and I'm sure they'll want to know, you know, how do I kind of get involved? Um, what are the sort of business opportunities here? What is the landscape like in in Europe for Twitch? Are you kind of expanding here? Where do you sort of see the opportunities? Well, Europe is the biggest region for Twitch um, by a by a pretty reasonably large margin. Um, we have more traffic from Europe than anywhere else. And so we put a lot of effort into that. We have, a, we have big you know, teams in Europe. Um, we have, uh, we've spun up ad sales teams you know, across most, most of the countries. Um, we, you know, we obviously localize the product um, for everywhere. Um, and I think uh, we view it as our job to make sure our product works as well here as it does in the United States. Um, I think more broadly, uh, the opportunity in the creator economy today, uh, well, as a creator, the opportunity has never been better. There's just so many more services, so many more platforms, so many more tools, um, and uh, and you know, I think I think Twitch is a great place to be part of the creator economy if you want to be a live streamer. But there's so many choices out there. Um, in terms of uh, from a from a founder perspective, from a from a startup perspective. Uh, I think the opportunity in the creator economy is to identify some new kind format, something, something, some new thing that someone might want to start effectively a little small business building online and sharing with people that doesn't have a good, good support for it today, and to, to build support for that, to help people, new people be creators who could never be creators before. Because as big as the creator economy is today, I think it, it can and will be 10 times bigger. And uh, that means there's a huge opportunity to, to onboard the next 10x of creators that are coming. Yeah, because I think that's the problem, isn't it? You know, many of the sort of top creators are the top creators, and they've got millions of followers. Some of them are millionaires them, themselves mm -hmm. as well. They've made businesses out of this. 
but breaking the mold and, and you know becoming viral in in today's age when it seems like they're all so established it's quite a tough thing to achieve isn't it that's that's my favorite thing about twitch actually um you can't really go viral on twitch like it's just not possible there's no there's no pathway for your stream to go from uh having no viewers to suddenly having 10,000 viewers every day or even for a short period of time it's it's very hard uh because you really grow your audience by consistency by showing up over and over again. Um, and uh, one of the things I'm proudest about on Twitch is, you know, obviously there's millions and millions of people who try streaming a little bit. But if you just look at the people who come and they stream regularly and they really, they're really committed to it and they're streaming every day, um, the middle class is bigger than the top. There's more total money, more total revenue, more total viewership flowing through uh, medium-sized streamers every day, you know, the people who have 50 viewers or 100 viewers, than there is through people who have thousands. Um, and I think that's, that's a really positive and hopeful sign to me that maybe there is a future where uh, it's not totally dominated by the, the very top biggest people, and there's room for people to be successful creators in the middle. Um, and I think that that's, that's true on Twitch um, because a big part of using it is the human connection. You're not just watching for entertainment, you're watching to be part of it, to communicate with the streamer, to communicate with the other people in the chat room. And that kind of optimizes for a, a medium size rather than a, a maximum size. Um, and I think it's worth looking at other products like that. I think there are a lot of opportunities to build things that connect people, that bring them together into community. And creator products that, create, that have community tend to be more middle class, which I think is pretty cool. And in today's environment, you know, the creator economy, I guess, you know, faces the same challenges that many other parts of tech and just the broader economy at whole are facing. Um, we've heard from Doug Leon at Sequoia, some very big VCs uh, at Slush about the macro environment and how as a founder, you know, now is the time to kind of control your costs and like you said earlier, reach profitability. Um, how is the creator economy sort of being affected by this? Because one of the, the big things that we've seen is, you know, subscription platforms like Netflix and others seeing a slowdown in, in their sales. Is mm -hmm. that also the case with, with Twitch? Um, I think that we, we have not seen... Um, we, the macro economy always has an impact on uh, every service, right? Uh, and we see, uh, you know, the same... We see the same things out there that everybody else does. But uh, there's the underlying strength of uh, more people joining, more people showing up, wanting to be part of it, um, that kind of counteracts that. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, coming out of COVID, we have seen uh, some number of people stop watching Twitch, uh, particularly people who started watching during the pandemic. And I think that's good news, actually. It means they're... They're getting out into the world. They're, they're, uh, they're touching grass, so to speak, and they're not necessarily online all the time. I think it's very healthy. I really support it. Um, we also see some of those people now starting to come back and, because they, they did enjoy the Twitch experience and maybe have a little more balanced approach to it. Um, I would say, uh, you know, yeah, yes, if you're currently running a startup, you should be very aware of the fact that the fundraising environment will not be as, as friendly. Um, and so there's a real premium on being efficient, uh, making good use of your capital, and spending as little as possible, making as much as possible, and trying to uh, run lean um, and not burn a lot of money to scale. But there's never been a better time to start a company. I mean, really, it was the 2008 crisis that caused Twitch to come into existence. Um, I don't know if we would have made that pivot or had that success uh, if we hadn't gotten really disciplined uh, through that period uh, and really focused on, it was great, every month we were just like, what do we do to cut costs? What do we do to drive revenue? And we became disciplined business operators in a way we had not been before. I, mean, I think it was really healthy for us as a business. Um, and if you're considering starting a company, like right now is a great time to do it because uh, you're going to have a tailwind. <laughs> You're going to have a tailwind for the next, you know, some number of years. Uh, we're going to hit the bottom at some point, and then it's going to be up. Um, and so I actually think it's a, it's, a, it's a great time to start a company. Uh, the time that's actually the hardest to start a company is if you started it, like, 18 months ago. That would be the, that would be the most challenging time to do it. Um, but, uh, 
actually, no one wants a downturn. It's, it sucks when people lose their jobs. It sucks when, um, when you, know, you don't have the same level of, uh, of growth you might be looking for. But it's good, actually. Like, it's not as good as not the right word. It's a, it's a part of the cycle of like, life. Like, things can't grow indefinitely in one direction forever. Um, you, have, you have times where it goes up. You have times where it goes down. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's about playing the long-term game and not getting over-focused on what's happening in any given year. And I, I can't not address the elephant in the room, which, you know, this week Amazon has had to, you know, do some, some job cuts. Thousands of people in divisions from uh, Alexa to Luna, the, the cloud gaming division. Could you just comment quickly on how much Twitch was um, affected by that? And, and you know, where, do you, where, where does that whole kind of layoff story play out? Uh, yeah, uh, the, the broader Amazon layoff story that hit, uh, Twitch wasn't really, you know, deeply part of that. Um, uh, it wasn't, you know, it's a, we are run as a pretty independent subsidiary. That's one of the things I've liked about working for Amazon is, and the reason I'm still there six years after they acquired us, uh, no, seven now actually, um, because we do get to run independently, but as a result, I don't actually have much of insight for you there. Um, not really, wasn't really, you know, we, we run our own uh, independent approach to things. And do you have any advice then for, for founders about exit strategy, you know, because obviously a big exit from Twitch to Amazon, mm -hmm. nearly a billion dollars. I'm sure a lot of founders would like to know what is the, the sort of way to go about that uh, and not be, you know, yeah, yeah. tied into something that's nasty. Um, well, I definitely think if you like working on your startup and you want to keep running it, um, selling it's a very dangerous game. Um, you have to really make sure you are fully connected and see the world in an aligned way with the acquirer or you will probably not want to stay. Um, in terms of exit strategy, our exit strategy was every time someone asked us whether we were interested in being acquired, I said no. And then I, our exit strategy was ignore the question entirely and tell everyone we weren't interested in being acquired and focus on growing. And then eventually I got a big enough offer that I was like, okay, maybe we, okay, fine, yes, at that price, maybe I am interested <laughs> in being acquired. But um, I think if you're, if you're thinking about being acquired, uh, you won't be. Um, it's something you, you, should, you should be focused on gr growing your company, serving your customers. I just had a look at the time. My God, where has the time gone? OK, I'm going to ask you now about getting back onto the yeah. creator economy, the evolution of the creator economy. How do we sort of see this evolving? What are the business opportunities? You know, it, it's hard not to sort of talk about other things going on at the moment. Yeah. Elon Musk is trying <laughs> to turn Twitter into a creator economy platform. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if Twitter will be around by the end of the day uh, sort of <laughs> at the rate things are going. But, um, you know, where do you sort of see this going? And do you have mm -hmm. any advice for, for Elon? I mean, the, the creator economy uh, is just going to be the entertainment economy at some level. Um, increasingly, you don't need... Uh, a, a media company package to produce things. Um, and I think you're going to see a really pretty strong unbundling over time as individuals or small teams become the dominant way that media gets produced. That's really what the creator economy is currently about at some level. Um, it's the fact that software tools have arrived for media, even for, for crafts, things like Etsy, uh, you have you have uh, the creator craft creator economy, um, and so as as these uh, as these software tools make it possible for anyone to get distribution and to produce things on their own, you just you get to go direct to consumer, and that's amazing. Um, and so I actually think any company that you know has a lot of customers, um, like like whether it's Twitter um, or any other large uh, large company that has a lot of users on the internet can and should become a creator economy company. Um, you know, you could argue that like app stores on your phone could be creator economy opportunities. I actually think there's a, the fact that it's, it's so hard for, some, for a small team to build an app these days because of the very high bars to entry there is a real shame. And it would be cool if you could build apps that were used by a few thousand people and that was, uh, that was considered a success and the, the app stores were built to make that a success. Um, and I think that that will happen. Um, and so I think over time, we're going to see the creator economy 
we'll stop talking about the creator economy the same way that people don't really talk about like the internet economy quite the same way anymore. Like it's just the economy, <laughs> um, and I think you're going to see the same thing happen with creators. And something that's quite big in 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 China, for instance, with with live streaming partic particularly, is you know uh, commerce and people shop for for things mm -hmm. on on uh, live streaming platforms. Is that something that Twitch could sort of think about in the future, or is is that something you know you have yeah. advice for founders here? It's so funny. We looked at like the live streaming in China thing, and that's actually an example where you you can't just go translate things one to one. Um, in China, a big part of the live streaming issue is uh, I don't necessarily trust the person who's making my thing is like a trustworthy salesperson. So seeing them on live video helps me trust I can buy something from them. But in Europe and the U.S., less of a less of a big deal. People, there's more. I think it's a slightly higher trust society where people uh, don't require the same amount of. Uh, anti-fraud protection from their vendors. Um, and so we've, we've not seen it work in quite the same way in the US. It's been, it's been different or in Europe. Um, but I think, you know, generally, uh, there will be those kinds of opportunities. It's going to be a big thing. Um, and uh, I look forward to seeing a world where anyone anywhere in the world uh, who has something to contribute, whether it's craft or media, writing, comedy, news, whatever, uh, they can go direct to their uh, to the people who love it, and they can earn a living uh, running their small their small internet business. Um, I think that that's a beautiful world in the future um, because small businesses are the backbone of a community um, and the backbone of our society in a lot of ways. Um, and we're we're now bringing those to the internet too. Cool. Uh, I am so sorry that that's what we've got time for, Emmett. I, I could have gone way longer than that but it's uh, <laughs> really nice chatting to you thank you yes. so much uh, thank you everyone for, for watching and uh, enjoy the rest of slush yeah thank you